Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're going to start today's presentation uh, of the discussion about the Florida legislation updates. And it's going to be a closer look at Senate Bills 154 and 360. My name is Doug Weinstein. I'm Senior Vice President of Operations for ACAM Onsite. I am joined today by the esteemed Lisa McGill, Esquire of K. Bender and Renbaum. And Lisa, welcome to uh, the roundtable, and thank you for coming. Thank uh, you, thank you. This is a really important topic. I'm glad that we have so many participants that are willing to learn a lot more about the milestones and the structural integrity reserve studies. Absolutely, I think it's probably one of the most important topics to hit condominiums down in Florida in many, many years. Uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, we expect a lot of participants today, and I know. We're going to leave as much time as we can for questions at the tail end of the uh, roundtable discussion. I just want to say, if you do have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we will attempt to get to all of them. This webinar will be recorded and it will be then the link will be sent out to all of our registered attendees. Also, I want to just state that we are going to give you generic information and discuss generic points of the bills that we're discussing. If there is a question that can, pertains to your individual association, that is not something we're going to be able to answer here today because neither Lisa nor I would be familiar with your docs or any other things particular to your association. And in a case like this, we always recommend that any particular questions about the Senate bills be directed to your association counsel. So that's very important. We will, again, we will be answering general questions, but anything to do with your particular association, you should refer that to your council. So in getting started, what we'd like to do on the first thing is just give a little background on how we got to the point we are here. Last year, um, the Senate, the legislative session passed a bill that we all know as 4D which established certain condo safety regulations uh, for the condominium associations in Florida. And they were basically broken into three parts. One was a registration with the DBPR that had to be done by December 31st of last year. And then the other two more important ones were the milestone inspections and the Nasir's which is the structural, in, structural Integrity Reserve Study. And there were certain things that were, for lack of a better word, gray areas or unclear. And these were then taken up in the legislative session just recently terminated. And they came up with Senate Bill 154, which I think, Lisa, if I'm not mistaken, is commonly known as the glitch bill. Sure, sure. You know, what happened last year, it was 4D was brought up during the special session, and they only had a week to really um, uh, conform all of the different House versions and all the different Senate versions from the earlier legislative session. So there were a lot of technical mishaps in the actual writing of 4D. And of course, everyone complained about all of the ambiguities and inconsistencies. So this 154 does a lot to clear that up. Great, exactly. And I think that's where we're going to move into. We're going to discuss the milestone revisions and clarifications. We're then going to go to the Sears report revisions and clarifications. And then at the tail end, before we get to Q&A, we're going to discuss Senate Bill 360, which has implications for those buildings that are in the process or about to do developer turnover. So it's also a very important piece of legislation because it, it uh, talked about such things as time frames, statute of limitations on claims for developers, uh, and so construction defects. So I think that will be a, a tail end, but it'll be a good thing to have for those buildings that are undergoing that. So without further ado, let's move on to the milestone revisions and clarifications. And Lisa, I'm going to ask you to go through these if you could, because there were a lot of questions that had to do with the timing, what happens if we can't get someone to perform it, and what is now covered, what was taken out. So I think let's start with just a basic update on 
what 154 has done to clarify these questions. Okay, great. So we do have the bullet points laid out here for you. And if you are participating, you will receive a copy of the presentation so that you don't have to furiously write notes if you're trying to uh, uh, you know, um, record what we have here. But one of the issues from last year was what happens with the mixed use properties? Not every condominium is a standalone building. So if you have a condominium embedded into a larger structure or you have portions of the building that are retail or office or hotel type usage, you know how do, how do you work with that? So the milestone uh, inspections are limited to residential communities, but they do include mixed use buildings. And the new law does require all building owners to contribute to the cost of obtaining the milestone inspection if you do have that missed use. Um, the deadlines, we uh, in the previous bill, you had a differential between coastal buildings and non-coastal buildings, where coastal buildings were required to have their milestone performed at 25 years, non-coastal buildings had their milestone at 30 years. They just did away with that. It was too confusing to define what was coastal and who was included, who wasn't included, and how, how you actually measured it. So now everybody's on a 30-year schedule but it does authorize local enforcement agencies to extend the deadline if you show that you already have a contract for the work to be performed and it's just, you know, due to circumstances cannot have it performed on a timely basis. Uh, a lot of questions were raised, and especially here in Miami-Dade and Broward counties, where we have the Ford building safety uh, inspections, which are known as the 40-year re-inspections in Miami-Dade, now it changed to 30-year. And what happens if you had your building inspection, you already went through all of the work necessary to comply with the building safety requirements, and now do you have to do this again? Well, the law now allows you to have a look back of five years for a report that was prepared, so long as the report is substantially complies with the new requirements. Now, the building commission is required to adopt forms to create an inspection program and otherwise define the actual parameters of the program. But uh, before then, uh, again, the inspection reports that are prepared for the Miami-Dade and Broward County should largely suffice. I mean, you may need some additional uh, work performed or some additional uh, tweaks to those reports, but at least you can take advantage of the work that you've already done. And the previous law did say that the board of directors had to distribute the information, but now there are specific requirements and deadlines for that distribution. You have 14 days from the date that you received notice from the building authority to tell all of your members that the that you received the notice and the report is due and only 45 days not only 45 days from the date that you received the inspector prepared summary to distribute that to your members i think one of the, on the, a couple of the key takeaways is one is it does allow the local or the authority having jurisdiction the ahj to theoretically give someone, give an association extension. But that being said, I think it's incumbent upon all associations that have to comply with this to start this process now and not wait to, to line up their milestone and their SEERS and try and get in at the last minute. I think that's gonna be somewhat of a, a, an issue here with the amount of buildings and the, and the news has gone on with such things as their X number of buildings in Florida, that would fall under this. There are only X amount of engineers. And one of the things is that they did change somewhat of who it can be conducted by. In, in the original Ford B lease, I believe they limited it to architects and engineers, but now they've sort of expanded that. If you could touch on that for a moment. Well, it's still an architect or an engineer is responsible for right. the actual preparation and sealing the report, but architects and engineers work with a team of professionals. So the, right. the law does not specifically dictate that the PE or the architect be on site to perform every single aspect of the inspection. It'll be handled just like every other engineering or architectural survey is performed. With respect to the SERS, we're going to talk about later, they did expand the class of professionals that can perform the work because it was very concerning that you may not have enough PEs or architects to actually do all the work for the buildings that require it here in the state of Florida. But I agree with you wholeheartedly. Please do not wait. 
this, this requirement is not going to go away. So the earlier that you can be prepared to do the work or obtain the inspection, do the work, uh, and the earlier that you're able to plan for your your ongoing funding requirements. So we're gonna talk about some of the details of that, but please do not wait until very close to the deadline because we do have a limited number of professionals able to do this work and they're uh, becoming more and more committed as every day goes by. And I think one of the things that we're recommending is that in particularly for just the milestone and the Sears, and which uh, I believe if I'm not correct, if I am correct, that you can have, there is no uh, objection or there is nothing in the in the reg that says you can't have the same firm do both. Correct. So in fact, you can probably take advantage of the economy of scale if right. they're going to be doing those, that work at the same time. Plus, if you've just if you just completed your 40 year or 50 year or building safety inspection, you have an engineering firm or architectural firm that's already familiar with the existing conditions of your property. So it will be less taxing on them to actually complete the forms or the reports necessary to comply with this requirement. Right. And I also think a good uh, piece of advice to all boards are basically when you get the agreements with whoever you are going to uh, retain to do both the milestone and the Sears, that they be reviewed by association counsel. I think it's something that you want to have correct language, that they're complying with the regulations as stated in 154 4D, and just to make sure that the language covers the association in regards to liability for pro producing the actual correct report that's going to be required. And that's especially true since we don't have anything from the Florida Building Commission that specifically defines what needs to be done. So you may have a report prepared that omits, you know, one or two things that the local building authority, the authority having jurisdiction requires. So you want to be assured that your professional will fill out additional information or respond to the local authority so that you can complete the process without having to incur uh, all kinds of additional fees and expenses. Right. And I also think one of the things that's also written in the bills is that the local authority or the local building department will notify associations by letter, and I believe it's certified mail, actually, that they are due to have a milestone or they need to have a milestone inspection. Our advice, again, as we just said, is don't wait. You know, we don't know how the local authorities in each town or each city are going to be able to gear up for this. Or, you know, you don't want to wait to get a letter and you get it, you know, two months before the inspection is due. So, again, we're advising everybody, and, and I know Lisa's advising her clients, as she said, not to wait. Talk to your engineers. Get your bids. Review your bids. Make sure they contain the right language. And then when you go and select one, make sure that not only do you have that reviewed by an attorney, as we just said, but also to have, make sure that the company you select has the time to do it. Now, there is an out in that if you have a contract, as we just mentioned, you can go to the AHJ and say, our engineer is, is retained. However, he can't do it until such and such a date. And it's at the discretion of the AHJ to grant an extension. And as of yet, we don't know how each building department in each municipality is going to treat this. So right. get the ducks in order, get your agreements you know, with your engineers, your architects, or your reserve site professionals. So I think some of the things have been clarified. And Lisa, you brought up a very good point because we're getting a lot of questions. And I think one thing good that the law did was allow you to use a prior report if it, within a certain time frame. But also, as you mentioned, and I think it's very important for board members to understand, as you correctly said, is that not everything that's required in the milestone or the Sears is covered under what would be a typical 40-year or 50-year or building safety inspection. There are other things, as you said, and we can talk about that in a moment, things such as fire safety and fireproofing and fire you know, things that may not be in there that have to be an add-on to an existing report. Is that correct? 
Well, sure. Um, I mean, the report, the milestone inspection report is to identify any existing uh, safety or structural uh, deterioration or considerations that would, that could lead to a failure of the building or an unsafe condition for the inhabitants of the building. So again, we don't know exactly what that includes. So in Miami-Dade and Broward County, it includes primarily the structural, which would be what you would engage an engineer to perform your concrete restoration, but it also will include your roofing, and, and it may include your electrical, it may include your plumbing. So there are certain aspects of the building or each particular property that may need to be inspected based upon the existing circumstances. And, and, and again, we don't know how detailed these reports will be, but we do expect them to be somewhat similar to the 40-year to the recertifications. Right. For those for those board members not in 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 Broward or Miami Dade, there is a multi page form for both structural and electrical that the architect or engineer has to fill out and make it part of their submission to the building department. Uh, there are also types of Go ahead. I'm sorry. I mean, other types of pro uh, components that could impact building safety could be, you know, bridges, could be seawalls, uh, could be other types of support structures. Right. So, so again, you're going to have to work with your design professional as to what aspects of the building are necessary to for it to, for that person or entity to include in its report, and then work with the local building authority to see if there's any other requirements that they have with you know, regard to lighting or other types of safety considerations. Right, exactly. And I think one of the things that, that, that people were talking about when 4D first came out was that there were all sorts of things, and we'll get in a little more into this when we discuss the Sears, but there was things such as foundations and you know, other items that were now taken out of the, with 154, but then it left intact the discretion of the professional as to what is structural and what is considered not structural. And, and discussions I've heard already amongst professionals are, well, you know, a foundation, even though they took it out, could be considered a structural part of the building, so it's going to be very interesting to see how it shakes out in terms of what is considered a structural and what is not in the end game. And I think hopefully local municipalities will be somewhat be able to clarify that to the associations in their their areas. Hey, and let, let's get this perfectly clear. So the milestone inspection and report is completely separate and independent from the structural integrity reserve study. So the milestone report inspection is really to, for some a design professional to come to evaluate the existing conditions and determine whether there are any repairs that are necessary to maintain the structural integrity of the property, the safety of the inhabitants. The re structural integrity reserve study is really a plan, more of a planning tool. And that is for you as community leaders, board, boards of directors, and you as management out there to know what what components of your property are on a life cycle and when those when those deferred maintenance or replacement costs are going to be coming down the pike so that you can plan financially for that work, not only financially, but you can plan to for availability and um, for access to the property and that you have everything that you need in order to effectuate some of that, that deferred maintenance or repair. So even though they can be performed by the same design firm or professional, the it's they're two totally separate things and they're for two totally separate purposes. And I think one of the things before, it's a great segue into talking about the Sears, but one of the things I just want to make a point of for both of these uh, reports, the Milestone and the Sears, in the 154, there is very definitive notice requirements. And the boards and their managing agents should be familiar with this because there's, as Lisa brought up before, there's from the time you get a notice to the time you have to file the report, who you have to file it with, when you have to send it to the residents, then there's follow-up timeframes that you have to meet that if you need a phase two, it's it has to be done within a certain time frame of the phase one. You then have to also give a report on the status of the phase two to the AHJ. So there's a lot of reporting 
that is included in 154 that you have to make sure that your association follows. But now that Lisa- you may, on, agrees, you may be on slightly a different time schedule too, because you know, the, the milestone is at the 30 year um, and then every 10 years thereafter, the structural integrity reserve studies are on a 10 year schedule. So you may have them coincide, you may not have them coincide. Now, if you're using a previous report, so if you're using a, a look back report and your report was done prior to 2024, let's just say, your 10 years is for the milestone will be on the uh, from the date of the previous inspection to 10 years thereafter. So regardless of the age of the building, if you're if you did your milestone early, you're still going to be on an earlier 10 year schedule. Right. Your SIRs are really on a 10 year schedule based upon the age of the building as a whole. Right. And again, if you have any questions on when you're due for something, we suggest you discuss it with the AHJ, your local building department, and your attorney, your association attorney, to make sure that you're not missing a deadline or to make sure that you have the correct dates down for also the reports going forward. Those need to be, those dates need to be memorialized in the association records so they're not missed down the road. So going so into, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 I see one of the questions that uh, one of the attendees said their, their milestone is, is, is due by 2028, and they're asking whether they should start that process now. Now, if you're way in front of the 2024 deadline or the 2025 deadline, you, again, you always want your building to be safe. So if there are any conditions that, that you think that would warrant having a um, an engineer come and evaluate them, please do not hesitate to do that. Just do that right away. But as far as actually commissioning the milestone report, you may want to wait until that 24-25 rush subsides a little bit. Because after the 24 rush, the catch-up phase, there should be more availability for for professionals and hopefully your you know the costs will reflect the additional availability right and they also i think there's also another uh, another uh mention in the the 154 that basically there is if you fall after the 7122 date of occupancy or date of your building there's, it gives you to 25 to do that milestone if you're within that following year period. Right. You have that one, you know, you have that one year delay if you turn 30 after July 1, 22, but before uh, 12, 31, 24. So it's a kind of a little bit of a window. But for the structural integrity reserve studies, seven, uh, Senate Bill 154 did clarify a lot of things. Now, I said earlier, expands the types of professionals that can perform the visual inspection. Like we said before, when you're conducting any type of engineering study or survey, it's not necessarily the PE that is there to inspect every single aspect of the building. You have project managers and other people that work for the firm. Now, for the Structural Integrity Reserve Study, before you had to have a PE handle the visual inspection of the components to determine the estimated remaining useful life. Now that's expanded to architects and engineers, of course, but it also allows other reserve professionals, people who have designations either from CII as a reserve specialist or from the Association of Professional Reserve Analysts, it's called the PRA, Professional Reserve Analyst. So that now gives you uh, more uh, you know, more availability. It gives you a bigger pool of professionals with wind which you can work in order to get this done. And also make sure when you're dealing, when you're going out and you're looking at professionals, that again, for the SEERS, which we're now going to swing our discussion to, is that they are licensed and then they are permitted to perform this, as Lisa said, either a licensed architect or engineer or reserve specialist certified under those two programs. So that's very important that they make that you make sure that they're included in that. Now, here's another important clarification, because from the original 4D, 
the way that it was written, it, there was no distinction between buildings that were three four stories and higher or buildings that were one and two stories as far as the mandatory funding was concerned. Now, we all know that one and two story buildings are not required to have a, a SERS, a Structural Integrity Reserve Study performed, but the law does require every condo association to have a uh, prior to this time to have a reserve schedule for roofing, paving, and um, and painting or waterproofing. And that those reserves are required to be funded. So this law does clarify that the one and two story buildings owners still have the ability to go ahead and waive whatever reserves they desire to waive or whatever, or they can repurpose reserves that they already have, but the vote is different. The vote was a majority of the quorum. Now the vote to waive or repurpose reserves will be a vote of the majority of the members of the association, majority of the entire membership of the association. It also clarified, which I thought was pretty clear before, but there was also a lot of debate that that uh, community, community associations that are required to have the SERS performed can still have their members vote to waive the non-SERS component reserves. So you have tons of different reserves. If you looked at a reserve study or you're involved in a building where you had reserve studies, you can see there's a list, a laundry list of, I don't know, 87, 187 items for which reserves are appropriate. And only your only mandatory funding obligations apply to the SERS components. And those are the components that we mentioned. Um, we can we can go through the actual components, but um, it's the you know it's the roof, it's the exteriors, it's the windows and doors. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Right. That that's one of the big issues that has been that we've heard in you know in the industry, and we'll get to that in a moment. I think one of the things that is so pertinent that I'm getting a lot from boards is that the timing of this. And one of the things that it, it, it has in it is when you have your budget approved will dictate when you have to comply with the requirements for including in that budget the, fully, the full funding of the structural elements. So let's discuss that for a moment in the sense of that the law states or the reg states that any budget adopted on or after January 1st, 2024, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. 25, actually, any budget after 20, 1231, 24. 20, 24, correct. So a lot of associations will use, will, will have sometimes their budget meetings held after the first of the year because of things happening in their particular association. But I want to make it very clear, and I think, Lisa, we need to stress that for your 2024 budget, it's incumbent upon associations to get that approved prior to the January 1 deadline. Well, yes. Well, if you do it after the January 1 deadline, you're just you're you're precluding the ability to waive any of the reserves, which means right. that your mandatory funding goes into effect for that particular budget year. But there's also another law that requires associations to adopt their budget at least. 14 or 15 days prior to the effective date of the budget year. Now, we all know things happen and sometimes a budget is not adopted, but there's no discretion when it comes to the mandatory funding. If you don't adopt the budget until after January 1, 2025, it must include the mandatory funding for the SERS components. For those, for those other associations, if you do, you still have the ability to waive the mandatory funding for the 2025 year, if you adopt your budget in November, December of 24. But again, you you do want to plan for any uh, dramatic, if there are going to be dramatic increases in your budget. So the earlier that you get the SERS performed, the earlier you can calculate how you're going to adjust whatever funds you have on hand in order to soften the blow a little bit to your members. Right. And I think one of the things that we've been talking with our associations about is kind of moving this idea of the mandatory funding and increasing your reserve funding in 2024 so that it's not a shock come 2025. 
I think that's one thing that can be really looked into by those associations which have a lower funding percentage that they have been used to. But now, instead of getting hit with a brick wall in 2025, it may be wise to start that process in 2024's budget to kind of ease people into the fact that they're going to have a larger reserve contribution. Yeah, I mean, the shock to the system is really the catch up period or the ramp up period, because if you were underfunding up until if you were fully funding up until now, well, your budgeting really won't change that much. It shouldn't really change. In fact, if you start waiving some of the non-SERS components, you know, who knows, your funding may be actually less than what you funded in the past. I would love those associations, if you're out there, you know, please call me because I'd love to have those type of clients where everything is funded, everything is on, on track. But the catch-up part is going to be the, the most painful part. And you can prepare for that now by increasing your funding for the mandatory components, moving additional funds into those mandatory components, or getting the work done so that when you start the mandatory funding, you're looking at a 30-year lifespan for those components as opposed to an eight-year or a seven-year lifespan for those components, particularly in the roofing, uh, the concrete restoration, which is the structural, and the waterproofing painting. Really, those are the main items that you can actually, if, if they're due now, I mean, if it's appropriate to do that work now, the faster you can get that done, the better you'll be when the mandatory funding kicks in. I think you just said something that's very, very important. And I think one of the things, and unfortunately, as we all know, these bills came about because of the, the disaster over in Surfside. But I think one of these things that is, is going to have boards now kind of get away from what we used to call deferred maintenance. Because as Lisa just said, this is going to in sure that buildings do maintenance and do repairs that affect the structure and affect structural components because the earlier you do them, the more useful life you can get out of them and the less and the more time you have to reserve for that. So again, the advice is please don't do deferred maintenance on structural items, get it done as soon as possible, and then you can take advantage of the longer useful life of that component. One of the things, Lisa, that I've gotten questions on, and I know has been a, a, a thing of discussion on the on the new bill, is if a, if an association currently has pooled reserves, and when they do their SEERS and they have the mandatory structural reserves, can they allocate or can they move some of the pooled monies in their pooled reserve now to meet the structural uh, mandatory components. So in my opinion, they if it's before 1231-24, they can, but it does require the vote of the membership because if your pool, your current pool now includes all different types of components that would not be included in the SERS pool, then you'll have to have the members vote to move some of that, move that all or some of that money into the pool for the SERS. Most of the reserve professionals that I speak to say that they're contemplating doing their, their SERS study with two pooling, two pools. One pool will be for the mandatory funding, the SERS components, and the other pool will be for all the other components. And that way, you, you'll know what your funding requirements are for the mandatory side, so then you can allocate what you can can towards the non-mandatory side. But in my opinion, you have to get a vote to do that. You can't, uh, the, a board alone does not have the authority just to decide, okay, all of our reserves now, they're pooled, so we're putting them into the SERS category. Uh, that's not appropriate in my opinion. All right, okay, good advice is to get is to get that membership vote. One of the things also that the law that 154 clarified a little bit is if you're in a mixed use building or if you're in a building that has components that are not maintained by the association, that they can be excluded from the Sears study, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, exactly. So the reserve funding only applies to the items that the association is required to maintain, repair, or replace. So, but it may you may have mandatory funding for your percentage share of those components. So if you're in a mixed-use building and your association pays 20% of the cost of the roof, let's just say, your SERS study should include 20% of the cost of that roof. 
But the big question came up because of windows, and now the law says exterior doors. Uh, many associate In many associations, the responsibility for maintenance and repair of the windows and the doors that are adjacent to the units or in, in the units um, are allocated to the unit owner, not the association. So in this, this does clarify that the association only needs to include in the SERS and fund for the windows and doors that it maintains or that for which it's a responsible, right. the common element windows and doors. And the same is true if you're in a, 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 a as I said, a mixed use building where you have uh, parking structures or entry structures. And, uh, and if you don't have any responsibility for payment of the maintenance or repair of those items, they wouldn't be in your SERS at all. But to the extent that you do have percentage responsibility, then that would be in your SERS report. Right. And I think one of the things that was weighing heavy on a lot of boards' minds was exactly what you just said, which 154 clarifies that in windows and doors, that if it's not an association responsibility, then it now comes out of the Sears study, which I think a lot of boards were kind of going, oh my Lord, is what's going to happen here? You know, we don't maintain them. Are we going to have to, uh, you know, do the reserves for them. So I think one of the good things about 154 is that it did clarify that amongst other potential components of a building that the association does not maintain. So I think that was a very good clar clarification. Um, what I would like to do at this point, I'd like to go on to 360 um, in that we, wanted to, we want to allow questions and I see we have a number of them. So I'd like to spend as much time as we can on the questions so if we could just give a little background, Lisa, on 360 as it affects those buildings with developer turnover. Yeah, so 360 is a, it's primarily a statute of limitations bill, but it, it's a construction defect bill. So the statute of limitations uh, for bringing a claim for construction defects is four years, and it remains at four years, but the triggering event of when the four years starts has changed, changed significantly. Uh, the previous law said it would be the later of certain events, including the certificate of occupancy, abandonment of constructions, uh, actual possession by the owner. Now the triggering event, when that four year starts, is from the earliest of either the temporary certificate of occupancy or the certificate of occupancy, certificate of completion, abandonment of construction. So in co condos, uh, in, and this applies to homeowners associations as well, you may not have possession or any rights of control over that association property until after four years elapses from the date of the temporary certificate of occupancy. Now for condos, at least there is a, um, a somewhat of a, 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 tr a an extension statute. So you do have that one, you know, that one um, ability to extend the statute of limitations for the three years or for one year from the date of transition, but the statute of repose. Now there's two different things. Statute of limitations is for latent defects, apparent defects. The statute of repose applies to latent defects. I mean, patent, I'm sorry, I said patent defects apparent defects. So latent defects. Latent defects are those that are not readily ascertainable from a visual ins in, uh, inspection. So even though you have an engineer, uh, an engineering firm, go look at every little nook and cranny in the building, an engineer is not going to open up the walls to see if the expansion joints are, are assembled correctly. An engineer is not going to open up your structural slabs to see if the post-tension wires are affixed the way that they should be or have the right tension and what have you. These are latent defects that are not readily observable. And it's reducing that statute of repose from 10 years down to seven years. So every community association, regardless if it's HOA, condo, or every building owner, really, anyone that's commissioning a new building to be uh, constructed, has to be very cognizant of these limitations so that you can um, maintain a claim should you have a cause of action for a claim. Another one of the big problems with this law is that it limits your cause of action to a material violation. So material violation is, de is defined, it's on your screen, as a code violation that can reasonably result or has resulted in physical personal harm or significant damage to performance of a building or a system. So cosmetic uh, violations or cosmetic issues 
while they're included in construction defect cases, are not the most important part of construction defect cases. But other types of defects that may 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 not rise to the level of significant damage to performance of a building or system may not be addressed or corrected by the builder because of this new law. Now, in my opinion, this is very harmful. It's very anti-consumer. Why? Well, when you buy a condo and people are buying condos for uh, whether they're buying it for the $350,000 range or the $1 million or the $5 million or the $10 million range, I mean, you're, you want to get what you paid for. And what you paid for is a property that is supposed to perform according to whatever the building code requires and according to the performance standards that are, are appropriate in the industry. So if you have a building that has all of these problems and now you that are already paid the, whatever premium price you paid for the for your property now have to pay to fix damages just because they they don't result in physical personal harm or da significant damage to performance of a building or system significant damage to performance of a building or system so you can still live in a building if you have some water intrusion right I mean, is that is that going to be considered significant damage to performing of the building or the system? You can still live in a building where where um, there are certain problems, and that might not be considered significant damage. In my mind, you should be able to you should be entitled to get what you paid for. And you paid for a premium property. You paid for a property to be built according to good construction practices in compliance with code, in compliance with the design specifications. And if they're, if the, the actual product does not comply with those characteristics, then you should be entitled to damages so that you can bring your property up to the standard that you expected when you purchased it. It is very important, as you said, it is it is what somewhat of an anti-consumer uh, statute on this. So I think those buildings under developer turnover need to speak to their turnover attorneys and need to speak if they're just beginning the process and get make sure that they abide by the new statute of limitations, which is of the utmost importance, obviously. I'd like to go start with our questions, um, and because I know we have a lot of them here. And so we have a question, uh, after doing the milestone inspection, when does it have to be done? If the property is 26, is, has 26 years and a milestone is completed, when will the next inspection have to be done? So you're going to be on a 10-year on a uh, schedule thereafter. So if you complete your inspection that early... I don't know how early the building, the local authorities will accept the report, but I guess there's really no incentive for them not to accept the report early. But on the 26th, then you're going to be on the 36, 46, 56. You're going to be on a 10 year schedule thereafter. Right. And next question is define plumbing is our domestic water structural. I think the answer to that is going to be, you know, as Lisa has said, the, the 154 mandates the Florida Building uh, Association, Florida Building Agency to come out with what the requirements are, and then also to have the local authorities. Now, in answer to that, again, I'm not an engineer, but the way the law, the reg reads, it's something that could, could affect the structural safety of the building. So I would think at this point, again, I'm just doing a conjecture here, that that would be more towards your sprinkler lines, fire department connections, anything that would affect potentially the safety of the building and having to do with plumbing as well. But it also remains to be seen what may be included in the AHJs or the Florida building when they finalize what the forms will be and what has to be inspected. Exactly, that's a perfect answer. Uh, what is the deadline to complete? Oh, I'm sorry. Is Sears mandated by law? Yes. And what is the deadline for completion? Well, everybody that every building that, uh, well, three stories and higher, first of all, that attained age 30 before um, 2020, July 1, 2022, must have their first inspection performed and the report actually submitted to the building authority by 1231-24. So if you're 30 years before 
7122. It, the, the initial due date is 1231-24. If you have, if you're in that small period of time from July 1, 22 through 1231-24, you have until 1231-25 to get that inspection and the report into the building authority. Other, otherwise, it's when your building reaches the age 30 years old. And like, like Doug is, she indicated a little bit earlier, the, the local authority having jurisdiction will send you a letter. So send you a letter of certified mail saying, hey, your building has attained the age of 30, your report is due. And you have 180 days from the date of that letter to submit your report to the local jurisdiction. And the, oh, phase two. So, so you submit your report, the first report you submit within 180 days of receiving your letter saying that the report is due. Then if, if a phase two report is required within 180 days of the first report, your design professional has to provide an update to the building department as to the status of the phase two work or the phase two report. Great. And then they have, I have a question here. I'm not a PRA and what was the other title? So this is what applies to the reserve study, the structural integrity reserve study. And a PRA is a, uh, is a professional reserve advisor. The other designation is RS, reserve specialist. And um, I'm sure that anybody that you ask will provide you with those credentials, but the PRA is from the Association of Professional Reserve Advisors. That's an, a national organization. And the reserve specialist is a designation often through, offered through CAI, which is the Community Associations Institute. So they've developed standards and protocols for performing reserve studies, not only for community associations, but for every type of structure. And they do have professional responsibilities and outline the actual requirements of the study, what's to be included, and how to calculate the estimated remaining useful life and the estimated cost of the deferred maintenance or replacement. Uh, the next question is quite lengthy, but I'll try and summarize it because it is it is an important point. Uh, this person says they have completed their structural and electrical inspections by different different uh, professionals, and they had some surprises. They had they did an inspection of a representative units for the electrical, and it came up that the electrical there were issues with the electrical panels. There were issues with GF. Uh, GFI outlets, there was issues with labeling, and their electrical engineer that did the study is wants them to bring all units up to code. And the question is, is that the city is the one that's going to be mandating what needs to be done in their acceptance or whatever. But if, if these components are not under the jurisdiction of the association and that they're a unit owner responsibility, how is that going to affect this? I come across this, I mean, I'm sure to come across this after these laws uh, come to fruition and after the requirements, um, the deadlines, are, are passed, but we come to we come across these types of problems with, with respect to the 40 year cert recertifications all the time. Um, the point of these inspections is not to bring everything up to code. So that's number one. The point of the inspection is to make sure it's safe. But if you do have unsafe conditions and those unsafe conditions are within individual units and the unit owner's responsibility, it puts the association in somewhat of a quandary. One of the things that you can do now to prepare for this eventuality is to ensure that you have powers in your governing documents via amendments if necessary to effectuate repairs on behalf of an individual owner. So for, for example, the electrical panel or the GFI outlets, if you have the ability, if you have a recalcitrant owner who is just refusing to get anything done, I mean, you don't want to be in a position where you have to now sue the owner to get the work done. And then you're now behind schedule for compliance because, you know, you know how the legal process works. You want to have some type of ability to actually perform the work and be able to charge the expenses of that work against the individual owner. For windows, again, also somewhat of a quandary because many of the older condominium associations, the, the responsibility for maintenance and repair of the windows is not 100% clear. 
So if there's any ambiguity whatsoever, now's the time to address those factors. What about access to the units for the purposes of these inspections? I mean, many of you are in a situation where you have owners that say, I don't care what you say. I don't care what the law says. You're not coming in you know, over my dead body. What do you do then? Well, you need to have the processes in place or the powers in place for you to be able to confront those situations as they arise. So, so if you do have many of the GFIs, a lot of associations, they don't have the GFIs in the right places. Uh, some associations have taken uh, the position that, well, this is a, a statutory compliance or a code compliance issue. So we're going to do it. We're going to just charge it as a common expense. Most associations take the position that, no, 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 this is an individual unit owner expense. We're going to get you to do it. Or if we have the power to, we're going to do it and then we're going to charge you for it. For fire safety, that actually should be a common expense. So the fire safety systems are common expenses. Uh, for windows, the same thing. If if you have the power, if you, if you don't have the power to address owner noncompliance, then you're you're facing problems on both sides because you're facing the problem on the owner side, and now you're facing the problem on the uh, building code or the authority having jurisdiction side. And I don't know if the authority having jurisdiction will be so sympathetic to your plight because unit owner or so-and-so refuses to allow you access or refuses to let you in or refuses to get anything done. So that's something that you can actually prepare for now. You, know, you brought up a very good point, Lisa, and it, and it, and it brings up an interesting question. With 154 and 4D, um, <clears throat> do you see that it would behoove a building, particularly an older building with older documents, to think about modernizing and upgrading their documents to incorporate some things having to do with these two bills, as you just said, with access and responsibility? I would think that that might be a good thing for an association to look at, particularly those with original documents. Well, we recommend it, and we recommend it for any uh, association that has antiquated documents because you know the law has changed so many times, and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to determine you know which law applies or whether the documents control over the statute or the statute controls over the documents. But so we we always recommend that we always recommend making any updates that are necessary to comply with current law, but also to to the extent that you can remove ambiguities. Because if you all everyone's on the same page, there's not much arguing you can do before the judge. What happens when you go to court is where one person claims the wording means this, the other person claims the wording means that, and you need a court to actually issue a, a judicial interpretation. You want to have it as clear as you possibly can. Plus, as I said, you want to have remedies in place. Uh, but yes, also discussing these inspections and the uh, work necessary to come into compliance, it would be great to have the language in your documents that gives you the ability to effectuate whatever repairs you need to do in order to be compliant with your local building authority so that, so that you're not facing pressure and fines and other problems from external forces. And then you can just deal internally with who's gonna pay for what and how you collect it and that kind of a thing. We have another question. Uh, and this is a simple one. Even if fiscal year is March 1st start, I think it's a, at this point, it doesn't really go by fiscal year on these regs. It goes by the actual date in the law. Exactly. But it does, that does, uh, that also factors into your budget. So if you're adopting a budget on April 15th for mm -hmm. a March 1 start date in 2023, that's before the, or in, in 2023, through 2024, that's before the 1231-24 uh, deadline, but your that budget that you adopt in April of 24 is must contain the mandatory funding for the following year. So if you have a March 1 de um, uh, budget year, you're basically avoiding your mandatory funding for that first three months of the 2025 year. Right. Next question is unit owner controlled association existing before 7122 must have Sears before 123124. But those required to complete the milestone 
before 1231-26 may complete the Sears simultaneously with the milestone, but no later than 1231-26. So are we saying that all condos with milestones required after 1231-26, are this person's one is due in 28, can do the Sears simultaneously, or are all Sears due by 1231-24? No. Um, and again, this is something I'd like to look at a little bit more detailed because, you know, of all the numbers, you know, with all the timelines, but the Sears are on the 10 year schedule. So even buildings that are in the 20 year range, they don't have to have their milestone done for another 10 whole years. They're still going to have to have their SERS done right. by 12, 31, 24, Correct. because they're over the 10 years. Right. Exactly. So I think I think that the, the general again, this is something that you might want to discuss with your association council if you get into the particulars about date requirements and meeting the exact dates. But for a general rule of thumb on the Sears is that the important date is at 1231-24. And the 10 years. And the 10 years, correct. And another question is, please define exterior doors, living area and or common limited common areas. Good question. Uh, you know, one of the things in terms of exterior doors, I think one of the things, again, Lisa, that I would go to and, and ask you on this is, again, it would mean exterior doors that the association is responsible for. Well, OK, as far as the SERS is concerned, yes. So it's any exterior door or window for which the association bears responsibility. So your governing documents may allocate responsibility for the limited common elements or limited common areas to the individual owners. In that situation, the association would not include those particular doors or windows in its SEER study or in its SEER's funding. But again, it depends on what your governing documents say. Um, as far as the allocation of maintenance responsibility. Does the inflation adjustment pertain to both Sears and non-Sears components? In my, uh, I, I believe so. I see no reason why you would not be able to adjust the non-Sears components for inflation purposes. In fact, the way the law works now is that you're basically obligated to adjust your reserves on an annual basis, depending on what work you've performed during the year, the fiscal year, and whether or not there are extensions to life of those components due to, to other factors or lessening or or whether the the lifestyle the life cycle of those particular components is uh is now aggravated because of some other type of condition. So I see no reason why you wouldn't be able to adjust your non-Sears reserves for either inflation or any other reason for which it's appropriate. And this is, a, this is an interesting question. What steps are necessary to take under the new law uh, when an association has never had a reserve fund? Wow. So um, this is the association that I say do this now so that you can start funding something now so that when 2025, the end of 24 comes and you have to adopt that um, budget, I mean, the end of 25 uh, comes and you have to adopt that budget for 26, then it's not going to be a huge shock to the system because, or have all those components, as many components as you can replaced or updated so that you're starting with the 30 year life. Uh, because if you've never had reserves before, you're starting with zero, and that's going to just increase your funding obligations. It's good. It's a good point because there are a number of associations that do not have a, a reserve, so that's very, very good information. Um, I now, there's a lot of debate about you know whether reserve. It, it, it also depends on the community itself because there's a lot of debate, especially with the more affluent communities where you know your unit owners can just write a check for whatever they want you know, the day after you tell them that it's due. You know whether it's it, it's worthwhile for the association to have those funds collected and not you know not gaining as much income or working as as beneficial to the members as appropriate but again we can't you know we can't really philosophize on that 
aspect of this law, it's possible in the future there will be alternative funding mechanisms. In fact, 154 does leave an alternative funding mechanism open for multi-condo associations, but that has yet to be defined, so it's really hard to discuss at this point. Um, but yeah, no, if you're starting from zero, it's going to be a big hit to this. It's going to be a big shock to the system, a little bit more significant than it would be if you were otherwise maintaining a certain reserve level. Exactly. Next question is, my association had a reserve study performed in 2019. Is that study good until 2028 or we need to do a new Sears by December 31st, 24? You probably will have to modify that reserve study right. because that was not a structural integrity reserve Correct. study. So you may not have all of the components that are identified in the law for structural integrity reserves, number one. Number two, you may want to reallocate how you're collecting or funding those reserves so that you can maximize or, or minimize the increases that will take effect when the mandatory funding comes in. So if you just did it in 2019, uh, it, it would be appropriate to go back to that reserve professional and and ask what it would cost or how you can get it updated so that it is compliant with the new law. And provided that they are authorized under the, the terms of 154 that they can perform the Sears. Correct. Very, very good point. Very good point. Um, next question. Is a seawall considered part of Sears? It's a good question. Um, you know, that's something where it could be, as, as we said before, I think Lisa mentioned, that could be something that could be considered structural. If, if the reserve professional says that the seawall, um, or um, failure to maintain the seawall will affect the structural integrity of the building, then yes, the reserve professional will include it in the study. But I would, I again, reserve uh, defer to the reserve professional to determine what is necessary to include in the study if it's not specifically enumerated in the law. Uh, SB4D does not specify the time frame, time frame to distribute the milestone inspection summary to the unit owners from the date received. Please clarify. Also. What if the board wants to wait on distributing the report, quote unquote, upon receipt? I think 154, as we mentioned before, clarifies the time frames for both the milestone and the Sears on when you have to distribute them to unit owners. And when you well, have the milestone has to be the, the inspector prepared summary has to be distributed within 45 days of receipt of the inspector prepared summary. So that's it. That's a deadline right there. Um, offhand, I, I don't recall what the actual deadline is for distribution of the Sears report, although it would be included in every annual budget because you'd have to include it in you have to include those in components in your budget. So it's basically an, an, an ongoing obligation to disclose because it's in your budget right. on a yearly basis. And 154 also, a large part of 154 also says, you know, it's it, again, it's sort of redundant from the, the documents that have to be loaded onto your website for those buildings that need to, 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 you know, those over and above the units that are required. So there's all sorts of things in 154 Technically, that you know you're supposed to have it included in 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 your website, things such as that. But one of the things too is also, and we've talked about the milestone a lot. And I just want to remind uh, our audience that the milestone consists of potentially two parts: a phase one and a phase two. So during the phase one, if the engine, if the professional doing the phase one deems that a phase two is necessary, there also are dates that has the phase two has to be completed, has to be distributed, has to be filed with the AHJ. So if you are involved in a phase two, there are additional deadlines that you're going to have to meet across the board. 
And there are disclosures for, for sales purposes. Now, developers have disclosure obligations, and there are abilities to void or cancel contracts if the disclosures are not made. But sellers have the obligation to disclose the, this information. And that's going to be, that could result in somewhat of an administrative burden on the association or on management, because now management will be tasked with providing these documents in connection with, with sales. Now, we haven't addressed how to exactly deal with that on a large scale basis, but I'm sure, you know, big companies like yours will develop a program that will facilitate furnishing those documents so that you don't, don't uh, boggle down your individual managers with this, these tasks on a daily or weekly basis and make it easier for the real estate agents that are involved. But uh, again, uh, I, I can see scenarios where real estate agents just, you know, haphazardly are calling associations asking for these documents without even a transaction pending. And I, I want the association to be cognizant of its responsibilities, that it's a seller disclosure requirement, and to kind of plan on how they're going to address it when you know when that was this happens right good point good point on transactions uh next question is it clear under sb 154 that sears reserves can be funded using the pooling method it's very clear. Yes, it's very clear that you could pool the funds. It's also clear from the sponsors of the bills that you can have two different pools like we talked about before. Are unit front doors and hallways considered common elements? Who is responsible for these doors? The unit owner on the association. I think this begs to look at your individual documents to really answer that question. It's not a, a across the board definitive answer that would be done by what's listed as a, a common element, limited column element, or responsibility of the unit owners. Exactly. You know, and some of the older properties, you know, you have the delineation or the of the boundaries of the units. So that's going to determine what's inside the unit and what's considered outside the unit and therefore common element. But the boundaries of the units is not dispositive of who's responsible for maintenance. So the documents will have the maintenance allocation as well. Uh, how frequently should a reserve study be conducted? Well, according to this, you're, you're obligated to update it on the 10-year basis. If you speak to reserve professionals, they really prefer to update on a three-year basis, but those, those types of interim updates can be done without a site visit and are not necessarily you know, very costly. So the, the, the recommended um, um, timeline is on the three-year basis. Uh, I was also a member of, a, a, performed as a member of a task force for CAI on reserve study standards and reserve funding. And we uh, recommended uh, a five-year for statutory compliance, but a for best practices on a three-year, on a three-year update for a non-site inspection update. Uh, is the milestone the same as the 40 or 50 year inspection? Well, we're we're kind of assuming so, but we don't exactly know right. at this point. Right. I think it's, this is going to depend on what the Florida building code officials do and, and potentially also the, you know, your local municipality. Like we mentioned, Miami, Dade and Broward, you know, have their established 40 year research forms and what they make you look at. That may change or may be adjusted depending upon what the what the Florida Building Association does. And you mentioned the whole Surfside tragedy. And afterwards, many cities or municipalities adopted their own inspection requirements. So I know Boca Raton and Highland Beach, for example, have right. their own inspection requirements. I mean, we don't know whether those inspection requirements will now, you know, now be modified or fall by the wayside because you have state inspection requirements. Again, there could be a lot of changes on local levels as a result of the statewide inspections. I mean, building departments or local authorities really only have so much bandwidth as well. So tracking down, you know, their, their, whatever their requirements are and the state requirements, and if there are county requirements, we may see some changes going forward. But for now, if you're in a municipality that has that, uh, that requirement, you, you're obligated to comply with all of it. Right. Both, the, both the milestone and that. Exactly. Um, also, tankless water heaters that are not supported by existing electrical done without permits. I don't understand that. 
-hmm. Okay, well, tankless water heaters, you definitely need a permit right. in order yeah. to install tankless water heaters. And right. what I've learned from in my experience that in the multifamily properties, they just don't have enough power reserves to handle tankless water heaters, which is why, you know, everyone has a hot water heater. I, I always thought, you know, being a non-technical person, non-engineering person, wouldn't it be great to have the tankless because you wouldn't have all the problems from water heaters exploding or bursting or, or problems. But I, I, I was sorely corrected by those that have a better understanding of building uh, systems. Uh, if a phase one report includes repairs to address and it's submitted to authorities, do we have a deadline to start the work? The previous law did, 4D did. Now, what this law says is that within 180 days of submitting the phase one report, the design professional must report in with the building department as as far as far as the phase two is concerned. So what that means to me is that the phase one identified repairs that must be made in order to maintain the structural integrity of the property. And the phase two is more detailed uh, analysis of those repairs and probably progress on the actual work, bidding for the work or performing the work that's necessary to address those structural deficiencies. It doesn't have a specific date, but within 180 days, you've got to have communication with your local authority to say what progress you've made on the phase two part. Mm -hmm. Do you still need a majority vote to update docs? Is it a majority or supermajority as with an MA vote? It, that's documented. That's every community is different, document dependent. Uh, SB 154 is not yet signed into law. Is there a deadline where this automatically becomes law or is it vetoed? So once it's forwarded, furnished to the governor, uh, the governor has 15 days to either sign it into law. If the governor does not veto it within the 15 days, it automatically becomes law. I don't know what the, again, our governor is not in Florida right today. So there may be hesitation on forwarding things to the governor's office when the governor is not there because the 15 day deadline begins on the day that it's forwarded to the governor's office. So we just have to uh, see what the governor's schedule is in order to you know, keep track of when these bills are being sent up. But um, it does have an effective date of July 1. So I would hope that it would be sooner than later. Please confirm the Sears fully funded reserve amount is mandated for the 2026 budget, not the 2025 budget. It's mandated for every any budget adopted after 12 31 24. Right. So we talked about this earlier. If you adopt your 25 budget in November of 24, you can have your members vote to waive the reserves. But if you have if you don't adopt your budget in time, and now it's January 2, and you're finally considering your budget for 2025, you are obligated to have the mandatory funding right. in there. So let's talk about full funding, because we didn't even have that question yet. Full funding doesn't mean that you have 100% in the money in the bank account on that day or within that year. It means that you're funding based upon the estimated remaining useful right. life of the component. So you have 10 years left on your roof, you need to collect a hundred grand more in order to pay for the roof replacement, roof repair. Then you have each year in that 10 years, you're collecting $10,000. So that at the end of the 10 years, you'll have enough money to pay for the roof. Again, again, just to point out in that regard, you know, it, it, it makes sense for associations to continually upgrade or continually maintain the property so that you can take advantage of the long, of longer useful life when it comes to the mandated Sears components. Because it's a lot easier to spread, like Lisa just said, a roof out that you just did because your roof was either aging or leaking, than if you just you know, keep patching it and then waiting to, and then you have a Sears that says the useful life is two years and you have to raise $450,000 a year for two years. So again, the more maintenance you can do on your building, the longer the useful life of components will be, and the longer you will have to, full, to fund those in, for the Sears components. Uh, where did you get find 
in the SB states that the milestone report must be distributed to the membership within 45 days. I looked at the bill and there was no specific dates. I will tell you just in a moment. Um, it is in yeah, on the website. Must be completed. Uh, let me uh, answer that afterwards. Oh, here it is. It's on. Um, I have to go back. Well, if you're looking at the bill language, because it's on line 321 and 322, which is on page 12 of 77 of the enrolled bill, CS for CS for SB 154. Um, but for me to figure out the actual section of it is a little bit difficult with the way that um, the bill reads. Right. And believe me, it, it, it reads a little difficultly. I've, I've done it a number of times and it, it, it's very tough to get through. Uh, can you repeat whose responsibility it is to disclose the milestone in Sears when a unit is selling? It is the seller's responsibility, but you can't, as a community leaders, you can't, or community managers, you can't count on sellers having access to these documents or keeping these documents or knowing where these documents are. Now, for those of you that have mandatory websites, it's easy. They're going to be posted on the website. Correct. So it's very easy for any owner to just download it and forward it on to their buyer or forward it on to their real estate agent. But for you that don't have those mandatory websites, you're going to have to figure out an easy way that you can facilitate access to these documents without hassling or you know giving yourself too much troubles in your in or interrupt your operations on a daily basis. Um, just a thank you. Did Lisa say that the Sears components can be fully funded using the pooling method? Just yes. confirming that. Great. Uh, we are in the process of finishing the 50 year certification. Are we obligated to do a new Sears in 2024? So you're obligated to have a Sears report filed with the local building authority, but you're able to use the 50 year recertification reports for the Sears, uh, assuming that the 50 year certification has all the information that's necessary for the Sears. So there may be a few tweaks that may be uh, sure. appropriate to include, but that inspection that you've just done and the report that was just issued by that engineer or that architect, that engineer or architect has the knowledge already to complete the Sears right. report. Right. I wanna just bring up a point about that and just make it very clear to everybody that for those buildings that are doing 40 and 50, and then in some cases 30, you know, for those in Miami Dade and, and, and Graf, it is it is just to keep in mind that you are still mandated under 154 and 4D to perform the milestone and the Sears. But can you use components or reports that was done for those recertifications? in complying with those requirements? Yes, and as Lisa just said, they may have to be tweaked. Some things may have to be added that isn't included in a 40 or you know your recertification. But just keep in mind that just because you've done a mandated recertification that you've now complied with the requirements under this law. That's a very, very good, that's a very, very good point. Be on the lookout for those letters from the building officials. And from my experience with the 40 and the 50 year recertifications, the building officials, you know, they make mistakes too. So they may not send your letter on a timely basis, right. but that does not obviate your responsibility for compliance. So, you know, be on the lookout for that, be cognizant of your timelines and, and be proactive about it. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And, and, you know, we've faced that as managing agents many times where, you know, everybody says, let's wait till we get the letter. And then you get the letter. And unfortunately, down at the bottom, it says you have until a date and it's two days from when you get the letter. So again, be proactive in this. Start these milestones and Sears now rather than waiting for an absolute letter. OK, because it may come with very little time left to comply. Our last question is going back to the uh, subject of updating docs. 
And that question is, how can docs be updated to comply with new laws if the current docs require a majority vote? If the update is voted down, are we stuck with the old outdated docs? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, the governing documents are are intended to be malleable. I mean, they're really intended to meet the needs of a changing community. But if you have a community of apathetic owners, it's very sometimes it's an almost an insurmountable task to try to get some amendments done. So there are techniques that you can employ, and it really does require some legwork on the part of volunteers. Um, but uh, my suggestion to you would be to tackle an easy issue first and try to reduce your voting threshold instead of tackling every issue at once. Because if owners receive a package of 30 pages worth of material, they may be less inclined to participate than if they are only asked to vote on one or two discrete subjects. Great, good, 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 good information on that. And I've had had a number of buildings that have done that, have done amendments to decrease the percentages required for certain items under the docs. Well, I think that's the end of the questions for this afternoon. But I think one of the things that I think if we can stress anything is that these regs that have come out have very distinct mandates, have very distinct requirements, have very distinct timing upon them. And it is incumbent upon all associations to make sure they comply. And one last question, Lisa, for you, before I ask for any closing comments but that you'd like to make to the audience is, and this is a question <laughs> I, get, I get asked on this, what is the culpability or legal responsibility under the language of these laws for a board to have responsibility? What if a board doesn't do it? Well, I mean, there are remedies available to you. Now, this new law uh, defines the failure to obtain the report, whether it's the milestone or the SEERS, or the failure to actually fund reserves according to the SEERS, and the failure to perform the work that is contemplated by the milestone or the Sears as disputes as defined in 718.1255, which means, but it's not available for arbitration. So owners have the ability to demand pre-suit mediation, but forget about your owners for a second. You don't comply with the milestone requirements. Those are code, that, that's now a code violation. And under extreme circumstances, the authority having jurisdiction can start code violation proceedings, start um, accruing fines against the association, significant fines against the association, $1,000 a day, $5,000 a day. And under certain circumstances, if the building officials are not satisfied that the structural integrity is intact, I mean, they can actually do a partial condemnation order and tell you to vacate until you do some uh, immediate mitigation work. So please, please do not fool around. My, my advice to owners, my advice to community association leaders, to managers, and to the unit owners is two things. Don't freak out. Don't freak out about this. Yes, you may not have been funding in the past, and it, you may have a huge adjustment to make, but if you can make adjustments in, in stages, it's going to be easier for you. If you can educate your owners, it's going to be easier for you. And hopefully you'll be in a position where you can easily comply if you take the proper proper steps now. Number one, don't freak out and act early. I and mean, if you're facing that 1231 deadline, 1231-24 deadline, please act early because as we say, the competition for engaging design professionals is only going to become more intense as that deadline approaches. Now, if you're way off in, in the 2028-2030 kind of time frame, well, of course, you know, you have some, you have some cushioning there. Um, but but uh, again, two things, two things I want to leave you, don't freak out, act early. I think it's very good advice. I think one of the things that unfortunately you know, we've seen in the past on some of the regs that have come out affecting associations, particularly in things like the ELSS or, or other regs, is there have been extensions. But I think we're dealing with something different here. Uh, I, I think, you know, this is this is a, a much bigger of a safety, a structural issue. So I would be very hard pressed to, to even quantify or, or predict 
if they would do any extensions to these deadlines. So again, as Lisa said, very important. Operate as if you're under these deadlines. They are not going to change. Start now. Line up your professionals. Make sure that their agreements are in line. Have your attorneys review them. And again, any specific questions concerning your association and these laws, 4D and 154, please add, talk to your association attorney. They will know your docs. They will know your, your situation and be able to give you the advice particular to your association. But I think this is, you know, these are new laws. I think there is going to be some learning process. I, as we said, there is still some things to come out on these with the Florida Building Code, with the local AHJs, with the letters, with all of the requirements. But again, start your process now. Please don't wait to the end. And also, for monetary reasons, maintain your building. Make sure that you continually maintain it so that you do have useful life remaining and you do have time to fund those required 100% fully funded components. So with that being said, Lisa, I this has been an incredible discussion. I think you've brought so much to the table with your knowledge of both the bills and the condominium association uh, business and you know association management. So again, I would like to thank you so much for joining us today. And Lisa's contact information is on the screen. Feel free to contact her about any questions that you might have. I'm sure she'd be glad to impart further knowledge on this. And for those in attendance, I thank you very much. Again, any questions, your managing agent is there. Your legal counsel is there. You're also getting your accountants involved, but your reserve study specialists as well. So it's going to be a collaborative effort among associations, managing agents, design professionals, financial professionals. And the more we do and collaborate, the easier it will be to navigate these new regs and become in compliance. So thank you for attending. We hope you it was very informative for you. And if you have any further questions, our contact information is on the screen. And thank you again so much for attending. As we said in the beginning, we will mail a link out to the presentation to those that have registered. So again, thank you very much and have a good evening.